He's been at it the best part of 40 years. However tough the hide, if he wants to, he'll sting it. Such as telling President Kennedy's spokesman that his boss was a murderer. Even to kill his allies, like the Ziem family in Vietnam, the, the right wing. He had Catholic nothing to family. do with that. Oh, come on. He, there's no proof of that, you whatever. Had, you were paid to say that at the time. You I'm not paid to say that. We had a liar put that. We had a liar, that that liar no, make no. statements that, who was involved in Watergate. Now 61 and living in Washington, cancer came calling this summer. Christopher, can we start by talking about the cancer? What is the prognosis? Well, the, the particular form of malignancy I have is in my esophagus, but it's metastasized, as they love to say, um, to my lymph nodes. You can practically feel one in my clavicle, on bad days anyway. And I'm afraid to at least a tiny speck in my lungs. Um, and the prognosis for that is that if you lump it all together, and you leave out every other consideration, 5% of us live another five years. So that's not ideal. But I have a strong constitution, for example, which has served me quite well. Though if I hadn't had such a strong one, I might have led a more healthy life, perhaps. <laughs> But in the meantime, in the old cliche, you live day to day. Oh, yeah. Yes, one does. But actually, who doesn't? There is, however, I think something specifically terrifying, which I'm trying to oppose in my writing and my appearances about cancer. Are you terrified by it? No. I, I think it's a superstition, one among many. Um, and I think I know where it comes from, actually, if you if you'd like me to say. I mean, well, when I was a child, we were all very frightened still by polio. It takes an effort to remember that now, but in many countries, people still are. Previous generations it would have been smallpox, the heart that never gets the right rhythm, bronchitis, TB, all these things. But none of them have the same, I think, horror as cancers have been allowed to acquire. And I think it's probably because of the idea of there being a live thing inside you, a sort of malignant alien that can't outlive you, but that does, in a sense, have a purpose to its life, which is to kill you and then die. It's like an obscene parody of the idea of being pregnant. In fact, I've, I always feel sorrier for women who have cancer than men. It's, for men, the idea of hosting another life of any kind is sort of hard to think about. But for a woman, it, it must be a, a grotesque, nasty version of the idea of being a host to another life. I, I have a feeling this is why people propitiate it with bogus cures, terrible rumors, um, scare stories, and so on. And I've set my face to trying to demonstrate that it's a, it's a malady like any other, and it will yield to reason and science, and that's what I'm trying to spend my time vindicating. Reason and science, but yes. yet the word most commonly used about cancer is battling cancer, isn't it? Yes. And I, again, think that's a version of the pathetic fallacy. It's, it's giving, a, it's giving a, a real existence to a, something that's, in a sense, inanimate, a re real sense inanimate. Uh, it has a sort of life, but not a real. I rather think it's battling me, I have to say. It's much more what it feels like. I mean, I have to sit passively every few weeks and have a huge dose of kill-or-cure venom put straight into my veins and then follow that up with other poisons too. Doesn't feel like fighting at all, possibly resisting, I suppose, but no. You feel as if you're drowning in passivity and being assaulted by, by something that has a horrible persistence that's working on you while you're asleep. Does it make you angry? No, it makes me um, sober, uh, objective, I think, well, uh, this is a this is the best known of our our disease enemies. Um, I'm one of its many, many, many victims. I'm probably one of the luckier ones in point of being able to have treatment and care. I'd like to prove to other people that it's not the end of everything to be diagnosed with it. In other words, yes, it can be resisted. I think I prefer resistance to battling. I didn't pick this fight, but I'm now I'm in it. I'd like to give it my best. Shot. And as I say, what, what I, this means to me is putting myself on the side of those 
men of medicine and science and reason who are trying to reduce it to something that is understandable, assimilable to reason, and, and uh, that will be brought under control. But the likelihood is that it will kill you. Oh, well, the certainty is that that's what I'll die from. Yeah. Some people die with cancer. I might die with it. Um, it will be, unless I have a heart attack, which I could easily have, by the way. I, I'm much more likely now to have a blood clot than I was before. Or a stroke, perhaps. But, I mean, no, it's the proximate cause of my death, and I, I'm both lucky and unlucky to know it in advance and be able to take its measure. And there will be people, and they won't say it to your face, perhaps, but, well, he smoked a lot, mm. he drank a lot. Yes. Well, that's exactly what's demystifying about it. I mean, there are also people who say, it's God's curse on me that I should have it near my throat because that was the organ of blasphemy which I used for so many years. And I thought, well, I've used many other organs to blaspheme as well if it comes to that. Um, no, it's, it is banal in that precise way. It's, if you led a rather bohemian and rackety life as I have, it's precisely the cancer you'd expect to get. That's a bit of a yawn. You're not an old man, and you're living with a prospect of an abbreviated <clears throat> life. Yes. What does that do to the way you think about life? Well, it, um, to borrow slightly from Dr. Johnson, um, it does concentrate the mind, of course, to realize that your time is even more rationed than you thought it was. And though I can be um, stoic in point of myself about that, because everyone has to go some time, and whatever day came that the newspapers came out and I wasn't there to read them, I've always thought that'd be a bad day, at least for me. Um, I now have a, so I have a more pressing idea of what that might be like. Anyway, that's being stoic for my own sake, but for my family it's not very nice, and I could wish perhaps to have led a more healthy and upright life for their sake. Um, and that's a very melancholy reflection, of course. And then there are things I would like to live to see. Um, I've mentioned some of them in an article I wrote on the subject. I'd like to see the World Trade Center reopened. I'd like to see Osama bin Laden on trial, um, or dead. Um, there are places I'd like to go, people I'd like to meet, books I'd like to at least reread, if not read for the first time. But in a sense, that would always be true. I still, I hope, have these ambitions. Has it given you a mellower view of humanity? Mellower? Yes. Something about that word that I don't relish. I don't know quite why. Well, that's because you're a, a, you know, a, um, a polemicist, a contrarian. Mellower, no, I mean, political. no, if you like, no, it's given me a... If any, my view is already quite stark, which is we're born into a losing struggle. I knew that when I was well, or thought I, myself to be well. We're born into a losing struggle. We're enjoined by the faithful to consider ourselves to be born sick and yet commanded to be well. The whole, the whole thing is at best ironic. Some think meaningless or random. I don't know if I want to go that far, but it's, it's a stark existence. And for many people born in less fortunate circumstances than mine, it's always stark. It was stark every day till they died. This just makes it starker. Does it make you regret saying or doing things? This doesn't, no. I mean, I've sometimes had cause to regret saying things but, uh, or wish I'd said them in a different way. But that's part of the ongoing revision of being a writer, I hope. Uh, this hasn't prompted me to that, no. Perhaps it should. You're famously a person with very strong convictions and a, a very persuasive, forceful form of, uh, of argument. Do you have any... Thank you. Do you no, it's, it's, that's what you do. You're, 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 you're celebrated worldwide for it. Do you have any sense of why you were like that? No, I don't. Um, my parents were both people of principle, it's true. Um, but they didn't expect to inflict this on others. I mean, it was just something they were and something they did. Um, and something they inculcated in me, but they didn't want an audience for it. No, I wanted an audience for it. Do you regret any of the targets you chose? Like, I mean, who needs to attack Mother Teresa? It was very important to attack Mother Teresa. Why? Well, for the same reason that people admire her, which is you have to care about the, the millions of people who are stricken by um, 
millennial poverty, I mean, poverty of the sort that's almost impossible to escape from, uh, that was her pretended concern. Now, as it happens, it wasn't her fault. I'll put it no, by no means. Well, uh, you say that, but... Um, it wasn't her fault that people were in poverty. No, not in the first place. But as it happens, I, I'll, I could go on a length about this, but uh, summarize it in one, one uh, statement, which I think is pretty hard to refute. The, the best known cure for poverty we've come up with is something called the empowerment of women. If you give women control over their cycle of reproduction, you don't keep them chained to an animal cycle uh, of annual pregnancy and so forth. And you give them, if you, if you can add to that by throwing in a handful of seeds or some credit, you'll have done very well. Nowhere where that's tried does it not work. You'll see, in an instant, Mother Teresa spent her entire life campaigning against that. She thought that contraception and abortion were morally equivalent and that abortion was murder. Now, that's not what Calcutta needs, and I think her teachings and preachings were actually counter to the cause that she's supposed to represent. So I thought it was very important to point that out. Are there any of the targets of your polemic or essay in the past that you regret choosing? No. No, I don't. I regret only not doing more about it. You fell out with a lot of people over your support for the decision to go to war against Saddam Hussein. Yes. Do you regret that at all? Well, <clears throat> to, say had, people to, dead, maybe more? to say one had no regrets would be, I mean, would be un abnormally um, unreflective, I think. I mean, no one can be other than horrified than at the current state of, of Iraq. But I don't take the view the glib view that's taken by so many people, that the casualties are the, all the result of the intervention. I mean, for one thing, it's an outrage to the idea of moral responsibility. Uh, last month in Iraq, the Al-Qaeda forces broke into a Catholic church, as it happens in Baghdad, and massacred about 50 people. People say that's Tony Blair's fault or George Bush's fault. Don't be silly. It, uh, how dare you absolve the actual murderers of what they've done? Say, well, they wouldn't be there if we weren't there. <clears throat> Are you so sure? <clears throat> Al-Qaeda is operating in innumerable countries and was certainly present in the form of Mr. Sarkawi in Iraq before we got there. I'm not going to have it put like that, no. I also think that there was a terrible misery and implosion coming to Iraq as long as it was left in the control of Saddam Hussein plus UN sanctions that affected mostly the Iraqi people. I thought that was an impossible state of affairs. And I finally found... I couldn't support any policy that involved the continuation of Saddam Hussein in power. The private ownership of Iraq, in other words, by him and his crime family. I thought that you couldn't give your support to any policy that accepted that. So to that extent, I'm not uh, apologetic. But it did a lot of damage to the United States. And waterboarding, for example, which George Bush only a couple of weeks ago defended as not being torture yes. and as a legitimate means to... Well, I'm end. one of the few people you're likely to meet who's been waterboarded, I was, and I'm, I read with... Everyone um, applauds you for, for your I read with I read with, um, with uh, alarm and disgust uh, the former president say, what did he say, damn right or damn yeah. straight, some yeah. awful... Um, yeah. I mean, trying to live up, it seemed to me, to the worst interpretation of himself as a Texan big mouth. Um, I don't sacrifice any of my internationalist or humanitarian or democratic principles in saying that these principles are, however, incompatible with the existence of regimes like that of Saddam Hussein, Slobodan Milosevic, Charles Taylor in Liberia, and others who I think Tony Blair deserves credit for helping to get rid of. Whatever else may be said, that must be part of the account. You didn't ask me, uh, you only said, did I regret the targets I did pick? There are some I regret not picking. I was much too soft on Mugabe. I say it in my memoir. I, I claim to have had good reasons for it. I, mean, I was very keen to see the end of white supremacist dictatorship in southern Africa, and I was probably soft-pedaling what I knew about some of ZANU, PF. But having a good motive is not a good enough reason for doing something that was a betrayal, really, of principle. Anyway, hoping to see the end of these and others um, is, is a good reason for KBO as... Um, Keep buggering we, on. Well, if, you, if the BBC it. will allow that to be said. Um. Well, it's a bit early in the evening, but we can try anyway. <laughs> Family yeah. values. Um. Yes. Um, we're sitting here talking in Washington, and you have said that you, you felt you were born in the wrong country. Yes. Why did you feel that? It's a bit like the question, 
or it was for me a bit like the question, um, why did I want to be a writer? Essentially unanswerable. I could only say that it was more that I felt I had to rather than that I wanted to. And when I was not much older, I was in my mid-teens, I began to have a very strong feeling of a, a sort of pull from the American planet. It's the best way I can think of phrasing it. Didn't know why. None of my family had ever been. Didn't know much about it, but a very strong gravitational pull, which eventually I succumbed to. And now, because as you know, Kierkegaard says life has to be lived forward and then reviewed backwards. Now I sort of do know in that they were versions, the two things, of the same. In order for me to become an independent, self-starting writer, I had to move to the United States, had to leave England. Why, you may ask, I don't know, but it could have something to do with the relative openness of the United States. You didn't have to keep on surpassing so many approval tests, uh, as you did seem to in London. You're a polemicist. Yes. And, and you look at our country now with its coalition government... Yes. ...muddling along... Yes. ...as it's muddled along for many long years. And, and how, how do you feel? I mean, <laughs> could, could you exist there? In Britain, I have half of my life still to look back on. I was about 30 when I left. A lot of that was formative. Um, it's where I learned to love literature and a look at my bookshelves would show what I like still. Um, Anglo-American is what I am. I think it's quite a nice synthesis. What do I think about the Cameron Clegg coalition? It doesn't make me think all that much, I have to say. That speaks uh, volumes in itself, doesn't it? Might, it might, yes. Also, I suppose, for historical reasons, I joined the Labour Party as soon as I was eligible to do so. I, I, I watch more the future and character of the Labour Party. I, I still feel involved in that. Do you still consider yourself a leftist? Yes. Really? Yeah, I do. It's because, as you know, many of your critics would say, what's happened to you is that, you know, as your waistband expanded, your politics moved further to the right. Well, they should see my waistband now. I've just lost uh, 30 uh, pounds. <laughs> But not you know in, the, I mean, not in the nicest possible way. Yeah. But the accusation no, against of course. you is... Well, it's such a well-known script yeah. that it is indeed yeah. deserving of the name cliché, and I pin that sure. accusation on my accusers. That's what they're resorting to. So do any of these labels apply to you, leftist or whatever? I mean, you're more of an iconoclast, aren't you? Well, there isn't a global international working class movement anymore. There used to be. Um, some of us miss it like a missing limb, but it's gone. Is it likely to be replaced? I don't think so. Is there a, a socialist theory of an alternative world economy that, just in theory, uh, could stand up against the idea of a market system, however defined? Not, not conspicuously, no. In fact, the anti-globalizing movement seems to me to be nostalgic for a pre-industrial society in many ways, thus to be rather conservative. From this, you could probably tell that I still think like a Marxist, which I do. Yes. Um, you believe in the dialectic. Yes, and in the materialist conception of history. Yeah, I do that. The end of the Cold War really buggered everything up, didn't it? Um, yes, it did, but it was a huge release of human energy. Huge release of human energy and emancipation. It was a great day, uh, November 9th, 1989. I have on my, just behind me, you can see it, a, a chunk of the Berlin Wall. Um, on my mantelpiece. And I was in Romania to see the end of the Ceausescu regime, the, the worst of them all. And it materializes my view that, that uh, human nature is actually incompatible with dictatorship and slavery. Conflict is intrinsic to human history. Yes. Uh, and there will be some further conflict. Many people say it has already begun, and it's the conflict between the West and sort of Islamo-fascism. Do you think that is a conflict which can be lost by the West? Well, first on conflict, you're completely right. It's, it's unavoidable, and I'm glad of that because I think it's desirable. Especially in the United States, there's a huge privilege given to the word unity or unification, partly because it's a very various and um, multifarious society. There's a big need for good manners. But if you say, I'm a unifier, not a divider, you expect and you usually get applause. I'm a divider. I think only, only division can cause progress. People say the politics of division. Politics is division by definition. If there was no disagreement, if there was no fight, there'd be no politics. So the illusion of unity isn't worth having. 
and anyway is unattainable. The, what I do think of as the greatest crisis, greatest conflict at present is, it's a version of the old conflict, which is between totalitarianism and free thought, which is, in other words, between theocracy and the Enlightenment, and the, the form in which this is currently being played out, you could define as the West versus Islam, but it's not quite so. Within many Islamic countries, there are people who have a greater respect for pluralism than there are people in Britain who would like to censor me for criticizing Islam, for example. But roughly, you describe the, the outlines correctly. Yes, I, I, I refuse to be told what to think or how, let alone what to say or write by anybody, but most certainly uh, not by people who claim the authority of fabricated works of primeval myth and fiction and want, want me to believe that these are divine. That I won't have. That's the original repudiation. The first rebellion against mental slavery comes from saying, this is man-made, it's not divine. And to be clear about what you're talking about here, you're talking about the Bible and the Quran. Yeah, well, and the, and the Torah, yes. Yeah. All of these are works of fiction. All of these are depraved works of man-made fiction, yeah. And in what way does saying that you find the Quran laughable, laughable, laughable in places, in what way does that help the spread of reason? Oh, well, I think mockery of religion is uh, one of the uh, most essential things. Because to demystify a supposedly holy texts that are dictated uh, by God and show that they are man-made, what you have to show their in internal inconsistencies and absurdities and one of, the, one of the beginnings of human emancipation is the ability to laugh at authority. It's, a, it's, it's an indispensable thing. People can call it blasphemy if they like, but they, if they call it that, they have to assume that there's something to be blasphemed, some divine word. Well, I don't accept the premise. A lot of people in your position might take Pascal's wager. They might say, I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. Yes. But if I accept the possibility of there being a purpose and a God, I, I can't lose either way, because if there isn't, I've lost nothing, and if there is, I gain. Yes. Why haven't you done that? Well, I've, I thought about Pascal's wager and wrote about it in my book long before I became possibly mortally sick. And what I said about it was this. Shall we just quickly state what it says? I yes, mean, please. Well, Pascal was a great mathematician and one of the founders of probability theory, actually. I think it's his lowest point, is what's called his wager, or sometimes his gambit, where he says, <clears throat> rather like a huckster, what have you got to lose? You win everything if you bet on God, and you've everything to lose if you're wrong. Well, what does this involve, if it's correct? It involves a very cynical God, and a rather stupid one, who will say, ah, I noticed you make a profession of faith just there, and I also, because I'm God, I know why you did, because it was in the hope of winning favor with me. Well, that's fine. You'll therefore get it. That seems to me a rather contemptible thing, and necessarily, therefore, to entail a rather contemptible human being who says, I don't really believe this, I have no faith, but what uh, can I lose by pretending to God that I do? I might get a break. I mean, this is pretty low, isn't it? If I'm surprised to find when I pass on from the state of tears that I'm facing a, a tribunal, which you notice, by the way, you're not allowed to bring a lawyer. There's no jury. There's no appeal. I mean, this is all altogether unattractive. Why people want it to be believed their God is this way, I don't know. But suppose that I'm there. It may be a one-person tribunal, depending on your view of the Trinity. I would say, I hope you noticed that I didn't try and curry favor, that I was uh, honestly unable <clears throat> to believe in the claims made by your human spokespersons. Now do I get uh, any understanding? And if that doesn't work, well, then I don't know what would. But I'm not going to try anything um, servile. I'm resolved on that point. It would be more comforting, wouldn't it? And more comfortable. Which the servile? No. T to make an accommodation to have some belief in a possibility of this not being the end. Well, as long as I don't have to take the word of other humans on what are the necessary propitiations and gestures and subjections I have to submit myself to in order to qualify. In other words, there are, there are many, many discrepant religions, all of whom say only if I support them or endorse them, 
uh, will I qualify? Well, now, I, I don't know that there is no such thing as consciousness without the brain, for example, that there's no such survival. I'd very much doubt it. But let's say we don't know enough to say it's impossible. I, I would say what is impossible is that other humans can know what the conditions are whereby you qualify for survival. That I do know is false. Do you fear death? No, I'm not afraid of being dead, that's to say. Uh, there's nothing to be afraid of. I won't know I'm dead. In my strong conviction, I won't. And if I find that I'm alive in any way at all, well, that'll be a pleasant surprise. I quite like surprises. But I strongly take leave to doubt it. Um, I'm, I can't be too insouciant. I mean, we, we, one can't live without fear. It's a question of what is your attitude towards fear. I'm afraid of a sordid death. I'm afraid that, that I would die in an ugly or squalid way. I mean, cancer can be very pitiless in that respect. That's a fear of dying. It's yes. not a fear of death, though. Quite. There was, so if you, I forget now which you asked. What do you it's think... It's a good distinction. What do you think... Of death, no. Of dying, yes, I feel a sense of waste about it um, because I'm not ready. Um, um, I feel a sense of betrayal to my family and I like to think even to some of my friends who would miss me. Undone things, unattained objectives, but I, as I said before, I, I hope I'd always have that if I was 100 when I was checking out. But no, my, I think my main fear is of, is of being incapacitated or imbecilic at the end. That, that of course, is not something to be afraid of, it's something to be terrified of. Bertrand Russell said, I believe that when I die, my body will rot, full stop. Well, who doesn't? I mean, it will. That's it. Yeah, well, that's... He, actually, he does go on to say a bit more than that, but, he's, but that's uncontroversial. I mean, nobody expects to get their old body back. I certainly don't want the body back that I'll die with, and nobody would. <laughs> it would be no, doing no one any favours. So some reassembly of atoms would have to occur, but that would have to occur anyway, if only for us to be reunified with those who died uh, so that we could live and got, got blown to pieces for doing so. Do you think it's been a life well lived? Uh, I'd really have to leave that to others, Jeremy. I have to. I'm encouraged, I'll say this much, I've been encouraged in the last few months by some extraordinarily generous letters, including these are the ones I, I take most to heart from people I've never met or don't know. If they say that what I've written or done or said means anything to them, then I'm, I'm happy to take it at face value for once. I'll, say, I'll take that. Um, and yes, it cheers me up. And I hope it isn't written with the intention of doing so. Though I must allow for it possibly being for that reason. But in case you are <clears throat> watching this, um, anybody, and you ever wonder whether to write to anyone, I always do, because you'd be surprised by how much difference it can make. I regret, here's a regret, I regret not doing it more often myself. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.